Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, welcome to our visitors tonight. How many of you are here for the first time? Fantastic, yeah, all right. I'm very pleased to have everybody here tonight. Um, this program is both live here in Holly Springs and it's also being webcast on Zoom. So this camera here is uh, recording everything. Um, so behave yourselves. Um, that recording, by the way, will be available uh, next week on the North Carolina Wildlife Federation website. So if you have friends and you tell them about it and you say, you know, this was really cool, you might want to see it, they can, they can see the recording as well. So keep that in mind. Um, we're, I'm Monty Murray. I'm the president of the South Wake Conservationists, and we are an all-volunteer organization. And our mission is to conserve and improve wildlife habitat and diversity through conservation projects and public outreach. And this is public outreach. This is an example of it. It's a key part of what we do. Um, we have guest speakers like tonight, which I'll be introducing in a moment. And we do that eight times a year. And it's always on Zoom and it's always recorded. But four times a year, we actually do it in person. And we like now post COVID, it's kind of nice to get back together, isn't it? Right, in person, cookies, all that kind of thing. Um, we also do other programs. We have an Eco Kids program, which is very active now, and that's uh, that's also all part of outreach, but reaching out to kids and trying to get them connected with nature, not just uh, us old folks, right? So we actually have a program coming up uh, in a few weeks, which is going to be a waterfowl hike. And if you noticed here in Bass Lake, there's a tremendous amount of migratory birds right now, quite a wide variety. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun, and the kids are going to be walking around the lake, identifying them and sketching them. And then we also have our big event, Kids in Nature Day, which is on May 4th. And that's a really big annual event for kids. We do exhibits at local festivals. Uh, we do field trips. And we also do hands-on conservation work throughout the year. Um, we do pollinator gardens, uh, native plantings. We do watershed cleanups, keeping plastics out of the watershed. Um, invasive plant removals, which we just did a couple of days ago at Hemlock Bluffs. So we had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, wildlife habitat projects, we build bluebird houses and assemblies, and we place those at various public parks and schools. And we also have a deer hunter education and most recently special education around the chronic wasting disease, which is a, a new issue that has really emerged in a big way around here. So um, there's a lot of education uh, required for the public uh, to uh, deal with that, as well as uh, educating the hunters. So we work together as teams. Uh, we kind of organize ourselves around these different activity areas. As you can hear, it's a pretty wide variety. Um, so different people sort of, you know, like to do different things, and that's fine. Well, so pick the area that you like. Come join us. Before we begin, though, I'd like to introduce Luke Bennett over here. He is our conservation coordinator with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. He's on staff, and uh, Luke is going to introduce you to the um, the Q&A session, how we're going to do questions and answers, and how he's going to moderate the session. Thank you, Monty. Hi, everybody. Yes, as Monty said, my name is Luke Bennett. I'm the conservation coordinator for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Uh, I have the privilege of working with our chapters across the state of North Carolina, including the South Wake Conservationists. Um, and yeah, as Monty was saying, just a quick uh, just intro about how to ask a question tonight. We do ask that you wait until the end of the presentation. Uh, so hold all your burning questions, but if you are online and you would like to ask a question, you can type that into the chat or the Q&A at any point during the presentation, and we'll make sure to save some time at the end so we can ask those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Well, we have a great program for you tonight uh, about veterinary care for wildlife. Our speaker is a certified veterinarian in avian practice by the American Board of Veterinary practices, practitioners, as well as a certified aquatic veterinarian. She's earned her doctorate of veterinary medicine from the University of Georgia. She specializes in avian and exotic veterinary practice, which she does here in Raleigh. She chairs the education committee of the Association of Avian Veterinarians. I have to read this carefully because it's quite a few, <laughs> quite a few uh, mnemonics, and has conducted research on bald eagles which by the way, we have here at uh, Bass Lake, among other areas around the area, as well as avian cardiac disease. She's published scientific articles 
um, on avian and exotic animal medicine and lectures on the subject quite regularly. She also enjoys mentoring both veterinarians and veterinarians to be. So please welcome Dr. Serena Locke. Thanks, Monty. <laughs> Remember the truth. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, so Monty has already introduced me, but I'm Dr. Selena Locke. I'm owner of Avian and Exotic Animal Care here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And all we see are exotic animals. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what our practice does for wildlife um, and a few, just go over a few of the interesting cases that we've seen over the years. So we have a pretty big hospital, it's 8,500 square foot. It's dedicated solely to non-traditional species of animals where there rain, <laughs> rain, sleet, snow, or shine. If an animal is too nervous to be transported to our hospital or too large, um, we also do house calls. You could say we get a hawk's eye view um, <laughs> of our of our uh, animals uh, at home care. <laughs> so um, we're an exotics exclusive practice. I've told you that already. Uh, but we we provide diet hus and husbandry advice for our clients, um, but also medical, surgical and intensive care treatment for all of those non-traditional species. And so what is a non-traditional species? That would simply put it's anything that's not a dog or a cat like like geo here he's he's not a north carolina fox this is a fox from africa a fennec fox um but he's one of my favorite patients so breakdown of the species that we see um we see on average about 50 percent mammals 24 percent reptile 23 percent avian cases about a percent and a half of aquatic cases and then a percent and a half of other species this is our team. Uh, currently, we have five full-time veterinarians and one veterinary intern. This is me. Um, like Monty said, I'm board certified in avian medicine, but I'm also a, an aqua a certified aquatic animal veterinarian, um, and I'm an assistant adjunct professor at the North Carolina State Veterinary School. I'm chief of staff uh, of my hospital, so I help direct the, med the way that we, we practice medicine, um, but I'm also a chair of the Association of, uh, the Association of Avian Veterinarians, which is an international group that helps to provide educational material and learning for veterinarians around the world. There's also Dr. Dan Johnson. Um, he is a certified exotic um, companion mammal uh, veterinarian, and he has a whole laundry list of, uh, of accolades. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at the, at the, at the vet school, um, and he, he educates internationally. He's a winner of the prestigious uh, Oxbow Quest Award, which was uh, just last year. Um, it's kind of a big deal. It's uh, it's an award that's given to someone who um, who has made a, a, a big difference in um, the care of certain species of animals. <clears throat> I'm just giving you a little rundown of our, our team because we're all, we all have our own uh, superpowers is, is what is what I like to call it. Um, so there's a lot of different species that we see. Birds alone, if you know, if you're looking worldwide, there's over 11,000 different species. So it would be really hard for everybody to know everything about every thing, right? So, so for example, I'm the bird person. Dr. Johnson is the mammal expert for small mammals and. And then we have um, Dr. Sarah Sokolik. She um, has very strong interests in all species of wildlife and more like zoo, more zoo animals. Um, she has advanced training um, from uh, University of um, Madison, Wisconsin, um, Minnesota, sorry, whoops. Uh, <laughs> but she's also uh, trained at the Minnesota Raptor Center and Cornell, uh, the Bird Center of Ornithology. 
We also have Dr. Um, Alyssa Tepidino, um, and she works uh, more extensively with the aquatic species, amphibians, um, and reptiles. And she also lectures at uh, the veterinary schools uh, in the Caribbean. There's Dr. Christine Eckerman Ross. Um, she she does everything. Um, she's a palliative endocare life doctor. She's an acupuncturist um, and an herbal medicine uh, doctor. Um, so she kind of has different ways of treating things when uh, traditional uh, uh, traditional methods are not working. And then this is my uh, my intern. I'm really proud of her. She she is uh, from University of Florida. She's very interested in reptile and amphibian medicine, and um, she already has publications in uh, the Journal of uh, Herpetological Medicine uh, and Surgery. She also just recently underwent uh, some advanced training for uh, the venomous animals and dangerous species uh, handling. All right, so. Um, all of us have to uh, have a lot of extra education to see all of these species. This is some a program that our um, team does annually called the, Tur the Turtle Ally Program. It's put on by NC State and the Turtle Rescue Team um, out there, and it is um, available for veterinarians, technicians, and licensed wildlife rehabilitators um, and certified euthanasia technicians. What this program provides is training, specialized training for anyone who is interested in helping uh, to take care of and treat injured native turtles and injured native, native turtles. Um, so it's something that I highly recommend um, getting involved with if you have that desire. But um, a lot of, most of our team have, has undergone this training. <clears throat> Our support team, so it's not just us. Um, I have a staff of 50 other people, not including those, those, those veterinarians. Um, and amongst my support staff, um, we have certified wildlife rehabilitators, we have registered veterinary technicians, and even uh, licensed wildlife agents. So I'm gonna talk to you about kind of some of the things that we see. Um, during migration season, we see a lot of window strikes. Um, with species like, like this pileated, pileated woodpecker here, this American kestrel. Um, but we also see, you know, your migratory birds and things like hummingbirds, some of which will come in and be very starved and dehydrated, like this little guy. He ate a ton, he ate, a, he ate almost his body weight in, in fluids. Um, so um, during the spring, just like many wildlife rehabilitators probably already know, um, we see a lot of um, song, songbirds um, needing, needing food almost around the clock. <laughs> Um, my team members will, uh, whenever we get these animals brought into us, will bring them. They'll they'll adopt one of them. You know that'll this is this is my my bird that I'm taking care of today, um, and they will feed them every hour or however frequently that that species needs to be fed at that time. Um, and they even they'll take them home at night, and then eventually they will be placed with a wildlife rehabilitator prior to release. <laughs> some little, little bluebirds. During the spring, we hear this around the hospital. We didn't have <laughs> so what you'll also notice in the background of this is that our hospital is very quiet. You're not hearing barking dogs, you're not hearing, you know, crazy sounds and that's important because a lot of the species that we see are prey species and that would be very um, unnerving to them. So uh, in addition to songbirds we we see a lot of young raptors that are orphaned um, like like this uh, like these barred owls and screech owls and these little eaglets here. This eagle here actually ended up having to have wing surgery um, and unfortunately it, it didn't make it, uh, but, after, but we, we all gave it a, our good try, um, and, and he underwent weeks of treatment. 
This is a little um, orphaned owl, barred owl eaglet that came into our office. Um, and the, the people, of course, um, wanted to keep it. Well, I, I talked them out of that and got them to relinquish it to the hospital. The only reason that they had brought it in was because this little eaglet had, had stopped standing. So, so the, the kids, they were college kids, they were trying to help it. Um, and they didn't look, think to seek out um, a rehabilitator. So they were feeding them hot dogs and pizza. They were college kids, obviously. Um, and if you can imagine, this poor little guy came in um, and he, he had rickets, basically. He had osteomalacia. Um, those bones there are not supposed to bend that way. Um, but because his bone density was so, uh, his bones were so fragile, we couldn't do uh, the typical, and they were growing so fast, we couldn't do typical like orthopedics uh, repair on him because they would just fracture like a, like a candy straw. Um, so we ended up putting some leg bandages on him and we set up a sling in our hospital um, and uh, we were able to nurse him back to care and get him out to a rehabilitator for release later. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so um, in addition to birds, um, we also would get the, we, we get uh, quite a few mammals um, that have been orphaned. Usually during the spring, when we get calls about baby rabbits, um, we try to get the get the, the clients to put them back, leave them where they are. You know, mom only feeds them like once or twice a day. So, so, and she's off doing her own thing. Um, these guys are pretty self-sufficient, but sometimes when they know that the mother has been killed by a dog attack or a cat attack, we will oftentimes have to bottle feed them again another species that we're gonna have to feed throughout the night, all around the clock. And again, my wonderful team will pull together and they will be like, okay, so you took him home last night. You're probably pretty exhausted having to get up every hour to feed and um, you know what have you, um, I'll take it tonight. I have a great team. Um, so uh, just here's a dog, dog and cat attacks, cats, um, while cats being outside, um, they, they put such a, a negative impact on our, our local wildlife. Um, and if a dog or a cat especially um, does attack a, an animal like this, they, they will need medical treatment. Uh, the bacteria in their mouth is uh, going to lead to sepsis if this poor baby rabbit isn't, isn't treated. This little guy had to undergo fluid therapy and um, some some uh, laceration repair that re required stitches. <clears throat> we also do see the occasional orphaned fawn, um, which we we will uh, get out to a rehabilitator. This girl here, her um, she was in a neighborhood. Her mother and mother lived in a neighborhood. Deer crazy uh, <laughs> proliferative up here. Um, and uh, the mother had been hit by a car and she was found on the side of the road. We do get other hit by car cases um, where we will humanely uh, end those animals suffering um, like we had to do with this poor uh, fawn here. Um, but it, it, is, it is a kind service um, that, that, we, that we give. Another um, animal that was orphaned um, was, does anybody know what this is? A mink, yes, yes. I didn't even really know that these, you know, were common here, or I don't know if they're common, but I didn't realize that they they were here. Um, but this um, this little guy was found on the side of the road, and he had a fracture. This was a baby, actually, and it's I don't know where its mother was, but it it was on the side of the road, and a good Samaritan brought it into us. They were all bloodied up because even that small, these things are vicious <laughs> and very stinky. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he had a, a hum proximal humeral fracture here, which we ended up bandaging, and then we, uh, we were able to put it in a splint and um, get it off to a rehabilitator, and he was later released. Yeah, adorable. 
in the spring, we got a, we get a lot of injuries from gardening uh, tools. Um, this poor little toad had been weed whacked. Um, yeah. And his lip was uh, torn open. And um, uh, one of my associates uh, was so kind and re uh, fixed his lip all up. We kept him for a little while, sent him off to uh, the turtle rescue team. They, they do more than just turtles. Um, they rehabbed him and then they released him. Mm -hmm. So this right here, that little square apparatus there, that's a Doppler. So he, he's been sedated, anesthetized, um, so that he doesn't feel, you know, us putting these needles through his lips. Um, and then that's used to monitor his heart rate. <laughs> we do also, <laughs> yeah, yes. Correct identification there. Um, so, so uh, this bird netting, it's, it's, oh, it's, I know why people use it, but I, I see so many poor innocent animals that get stuck in it. Um, and that was the case with this copperhead. And who are you gonna call, you know, to get, to get this animal taken care of? Um, well, somebody called us and they brought it in. Uh, we anesthetized it. This is um, oxygen and uh, an inhalant gas. He also got some injectable medications. Um, and we were able to remove the bird netting. That, those are the injuries. Yeah, yeah. Um, he required a couple of stitches, but. And then he was recovered and then released into a safer place. <laughs> That's actually one of my, uh, that reminds me of one of my favorite stories of uh, my mentor, Dr. Dr. Johnson. So um, Dr. Johnson, he used to see dogs and cats before he started our practice back in 96. Well, so he's seeing this dog and the owners have brought in their dog because it's been bitten by a copperhead, right? And he's like, well, how do you know it's a copperhead? He's like, well, because I chopped it up and it's in a bucket in the back of my truck, you know? And so Dr. Johnson, he treated that dog and then he was like, can I have the bucket? And he actually treated the snake and released the snake later. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 We, we, at our practice, we believe that every animal deserves a, ch a chance, you know, like they were here first, you know, they they deserve just as much or they deserve just as much of a chance as we do. So. All right. So um, we also at our hospital, we like to educate and bring attention to uh, our wildlife um, and to educate not only veterinarians on how to treat different species of wildlife, like like here uh, us at this conference here, but we also like to educate our future. You know, we go out and we talk to schools. I love we love talking to uh, you know people like like you all. Um, and um, a new uh, avenue that we've that I've started. It's kind of fun because I like art as well, so it's kind of like editing. But I get to teach people online um, through different platforms um, about wildlife. So. Well, here's a little video on possums that I made. Learn about possums with these that we're rehabbing. The Virginia opossum is one of North America's uh, only marsupial mammals. And what do we know about marsupials? Marsupials are kind of like kangaroos and koalas. And the females um, have a pouch like this for holding their young. Um, the females also, fun fact, have, have two bones in those pouches to give it support um, for when they're carrying all those babies once they get larger. Another cool fact about marsupials and the Virginia opossum um, is that their body temperature is very, very low, um, 94 degrees even Fahrenheit, um, which makes them resistant to things like rabies virus. They are really cool little animals. In Virginia. Yeah, I just, we, um, even species like vultures, like they get such a bad, you know, they have such a bad reputation or or stigma around them. You know, every, every animal has its place. Um, and, uh, and so I like to, I like to educate people. <clears throat> We also um, do outreach programs and, and we're always at the Reptile and Amphibian Day. We like to do Bug Fest and the Wild About Nature uh, program that's in Holly Springs um, to uh, bring further attention to it. So i um, just gonna talk about some of the diagnostics that we can provide for our species or do. Um, this is a bald eagle, uh, one, of, one of the few, the many that we see actually. Um, and he's undergoing an exam here. 
Um, this guy was downed and was acting um, neurologic. So he was unsteady and he's unable to stand really, or he would fall over, fall forward on his face. Um, we did some in-house lead testing, which we do, you know, for free. We do all of this stuff pro bono for wildlife organizations. Um, and he underwent uh, treatment for lead toxicity um, and was released later. Um, again, we like to educate and bring attention to uh, different aspects of um, wildlife and wildlife medicine. Um, this is a, one of an eagle that I worked with. Um, and the research that I did on eagles was actually collecting data. It's not like I did experiments on eagles. Um, I collected data from all of the eagles that uh, were brought to me, as well as um, I worked with the uh, Cape Fear Raptor Center down uh, in close to Wilmington. Um, and and uh, did measurements on their eagles heart size. Um, and ended up publishing uh, the radiographic reference ranges for what like a normal heart size for the bald eagle would be. Um, this is helpful for veterinarians in uh, diagnosing heart things like heart disease in birds of prey. <clears throat> We also um, work with uh, client owned working raptors. There are falconers in the area um, and also um, educational animals like these guys. Um, these are licensed to be owned um, education animals for outreach programs <laughs> like this little guy. <laughs> Um, and these these two guys, so so the the bobcat here, and then that that red fox. Can anybody anybody want to take a guess what might be in that box? Yeah, well, maybe a little bigger than a bobcat. Um, so this is not native to North Carolina. I just uh, discovered that from our uh, board over there, but it might be a different species of cat that's native to the Southeast. Correct, yes. Um, it's this right here. So, uh-huh, yep. So there was a blanket over this and I was like, oh, I'm gonna just take a picture. So I, you know, put my phone up under there. She slapped the phone out of my hand, but that was the picture that the phone got before it hit the floor. Yeah, <laughs> yep. So, so she had to come in from, um, from a, um, a zoological park um, and sh she needed to be spayed. She was, um, she was having complications with her reproductive cycle. So um, we spayed her. She's just a big kitty. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it was, it was, I had, we had a whole team, uh, you know, uh, for safety and, uh, everybody was on point for what they needed to do. And we had many, many discussions before doing this. <clears throat> this was her all shaved up. You can see her little belly shaved up there and she's much happier, sedated <laughs> before she goes home. Um, her keeper sent me some of these pictures afterwards. This is after she was cleared. Um, and then this is just her little, a little video of her uh, playing in the water. Just a little. Well, it was a cute video. So yeah, it's a video of her playing in the water. Um, but that's okay. You can imagine her moving around and another cougar pacing back and forth. Uh, does anybody know uh, the, the, is it five or six names for this cat? Mountain lion, Mountain lion Coo puma, panther, cougar. And anybody know the last one? Painter. 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 Panther. Okay, panther. And then there's one more. The catamount. So, yeah. All right, 
sometimes we will see animals that have mistaken things for food, like this black rat snake here. Um, this black rat, rat snake, I will tell you, was driven to us from Pinehurst. Took a radiograph. <laughs> and he had swallowed a golf ball. We did surgery and removed it. <laughs> we were ecstatic. This is Dr. Alyssa Tepidino, and these two fine folks are in veterinary school now in their third year, going to graduate next year, so... So now I'll talk to you about the case of baby girl. Um, this was a deer that was hit by a car. Well, so baby girl um, lived on an apple orchard and had become, it was a very quiet place. Um, she had become accustomed to getting pretty close to the owner of the apple orchard who accidentally backed over her. Well, he just could not bring himself to euthanize her the way that people are trained to euthanize deer. So he gave us a call and he was like, look, I know this sounds crazy, but <laughs> would you do this for it, for us? So we drove out there and we, we, we were able to get a hand on her to sedate her. This is me back in my younger years. <laughs> um, we were able to sedate her and, and we transported her back to the hospital. I had to be back there monitoring her heart rate and respiratory rate and everything. And you see, we have a towel over her head to, um, to protect her eyes. Um, and we were able to pin her leg. You can, we uh, brought her back here for, um, he had, he had chickens or pigs. I can't remember something like that. And this was just a pig stall that he had. Uh, she could come and go as she wanted. Like, honestly, she could jump out. <laughs> so the, the door was just like this tall. Like we know deer can st step flat footed over that. <laughs> but if you see, there's this little blue thing there on that, the can't her cannon bone that's kind of far away from the camera there. But um, she stayed out there. And this was on the day that we went out to we knocked her down in the field and we were able to take those, those pins out and, and she did fine for years. So yeah, kind of a happy story. <laughs> and then we have this uh, Canada goose um, uh, in the story of the baby booty. So um, this goose was run over by um, a, a kid's bicycle wheel um, and sustained a fracture to its leg right there. Oh, we put a splint on it, um, a little booty like this, and we were able to later release this gosling. So has anybody wondered what the other one and a half spe percent species was that aren't fish or amphibians? Well, I would call it, I would put them in. We have, we have seen shorebirds and I almost, I took that, I took some shorebirds out, but. Yes, that's right. We see insects and invertebrates also. Well, and this is one of my favorite stories. Um, again, this was with this this story. This uh, story I helped my mentor doctor with years ago, before even before I was a veterinarian. I was getting ready to go to that school. So there was a lady. She was a teacher, and she was walking around her car, and she heard a crunch, and she looked down, and there was this guy a garden snail and she felt so bad so bad that she called us hey doc this is this sounds crazy we get that all the time <laughs> but can you help well of course we can we're gonna try so this is um this is apple before his surgery um, he's well during his surgery, actually, uh, the, uh, cucumber there is to keep him occupied. We had to pick out the, uh, damaged and, um, uh, pieces of shell there, um, that would end up becoming just a uh, nidus for infection. Um, we did radiographs. You can see, uh, the, the cracks, uh, in the, in the shell, but otherwise the, the structure is, uh, undamaged. We placed a fiberglass patch, which you can see right down there. It's kind of a little close up on it, which we would inspect with our endoscopic equipment like this. 
And would you know that when we went in there to look at this, that snail was just as calm as could be. And he would pull himself into his shell. I don't know how they do this, but would pull himself into his shell and he would put his little antenna over the camera and like he was looking in to see what was going on. Yeah, it was the craziest thing. Well, that snail went on to live at least 10 more years. And every year, that snail would go to the mall and get a picture with Santa and send us a Christmas card. And yeah, yeah, this, this is why this is why I do what I do. Um, <laughs> and with that, that's all that I have for you tonight. And now I'll answer questions. So if anybody has a question here in the room, we'll need to use the microphone partly so everybody can hear, but also the people um, on the web cast so they can hear as well. So if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. Start right here. So I work for the city of Raleigh on the Greenway trails. And one of the trails I work at is at Shelley Lake. And we have breeding nesting eagles that what I've been told have been there for seven or eight years. And this is my first year here. So, <laughs> but I'm also a forestry wildlife management major. Um, so my question is um, a couple of photographers have taken some pictures and they notice some strange or odd behaviors of said eagles. So I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing by them, obviously. Um, is there anything specific that I would need to look for um, that would be an issue with those eagles, any kind of behaviors or things like that, um, so that I can make sure that I reach out to any wildlife people uh, in the area to if there is an issue that we can do what we can to make sure that they're good. Yeah. What sort of strange behaviors? Um, you know, I, I'm trying to, I was trying to find it on my phone specifically um, what they were saying, but they take so many pictures and they're out there like every single day. So I, I'm not specifically sure what they're, what yeah. they saw until I see it. But mm -hmm. I mean, immediately at first thing I thought I was like led, lead poisoning and stuff like that because I have worked um as a volunteer at the um Center for Birds of Prey in Alwindall, South Carolina. I did mm -hmm. some volunteer work for them. So I'm a little bit familiar with some things, but I'm not like fully understand. But if if there's like maybe some mm -hmm. behaviors that you can talk about maybe that that I can kind of look for if I see some kind of notification from them, I'll be like, mm. Mm. Well, it, I mean, it, it's so what you're describing are neurologic uh, deficits or, or disorders, um, which can be caused by a lot of different things. So lead, lead toxicity is one, um, avian influenza is another, um, and, uh, which is, which is rampant and, and we always have spikes during migratory season, um, during the summer, West Nile is, is a, is a, a, a concern, um, and then it's also, you know, um, something that might seem weird to uh, a non-animal person may just be a normal behavior for a bird. So um, what I would say is, a, is a, if the bird is downed and not able to fly away or move away, um, seems blind, uh, those are uh, things that I would, I would look out for. But as far as um, I don't know what your level of intervenement would be with, um, you know, the eagles as far as like getting into their nests. Um, I don't know that I would advise that. Yeah. I mean, we know specifically where their nest mm -hmm. is. They've been nesting in the same spot for mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we we know specifically where the nest is. We've been, you know, people have said 
this is where they've nested for years and and we have our little signs up and everything okay. um, but yeah as long as I can kind of get a couple of like things to know specifically what to look for if I see these people post those these um, types of posts on Facebook and things like yeah. that then I can say okay hey wait a minute wait a minute we need to contact you know whether it's game wardens or wildlife mm -hmm. rehabilitators and that's something that yeah. I mean obviously at the end of the evening I would like to get with you if you have some local I'll people I'll give beside you my, yourself that yes. I I, yes. I definitely want that type yeah. of information. I'll also give you my contact information. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, yeah I have uh two questions so I'll ask them both. Uh, one is how do you fund your clinic? <sighs> and the second one is uh, most of what you showed was uh, were uh, physical injuries. What percentage of your cases are diseases? Mm, that's a good question um, for wildlife. I think it usually is injuries because they're acute. Uh, things like illnesses. Um, I don't think that the animals usually make it to me because they've passed and probably become food for something else. Yeah, that's a good question, though. Oh, how am I funded? So um, we don't just do wildlife. Um, we do exotic animal species, exotic companion uh, pets. Um, so, you know, we give back to the community by doing this work pro bono. We do also accept donations. Um, oftentimes clients will, uh, if they've brought in their an animal, um, you know, we're going to do surgery or, you know, expensive diagnostics and, and, uh, take time away from clients and patients that, you know, that we need to see, uh, our, our, our clientele will oftentimes donate. Um, what are the requirements to become a certified uh, wildlife rehabilitator? Um, I am not a certified wildlife rehabilitator and I, well, I was years and years ago. Um, so I, you would have to check with North Carolina wildlife federation for that. I had a question about the training. What what kind of extensive training must you have had to be able to give service to all these variations yeah. of wildlife? Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to know what a hotline number, uh, if, if there's a hotline number where if we see something like this, mm -hmm. we can call into and get help. So two-part question. Okay, yeah. So, um, so any veterinarian can see wildlife. Um, you undergo your typical undergraduate uh, education, and then you'll go to four years of uh, doctorate, you know, medical school to become a veterinarian. Um, I myself, um, to become a certified like avian veterinarian, you have to either do internships and residencies do publications and case reports, and then sit for, and then a qualify to sit for boards, which is a special test uh, focused just on birds um, or just on whatever species you have your interest in. Um, and then, um, and then you are certified. Um, make sure that answers your question there. And then the second part of your question was, uh, 800 number. So typically um, what we recommend is uh, checking out the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission website. They have a list of wildlife rehabilitators in your area, your county, your your, uh, your city um, that you can contact uh, to be like boots on the ground. What, uh, when you accept a case, uh, do you consider the conservation status of the species? Always, yeah, always. So if you had a red wolf as opposed to a timber wolf, the red wolf would get precedence? Well, if I was in that sort of situation and I had to triage, but you know, I, I got a lot, I have a lot of people that, that want to help. So I think that we could, uh, we, we could figure out a way to do both. <laughs> now, how about if you have a species that's an invasive species, like an English sparrow? Well, so that's a tricky situation there. So if it is um, invasive species, um, invasive species that are brought to me as injured wildlife are in the state of North Carolina supposed to be euthanized. Euthanized, yeah. So that they don't force out the native species, so.
one of the sad parts of my job. Yep. So one of the earlier uh, uh, photos you showed was like starving native species. Mm -hmm. Is there outreach you're doing? I know as the Wildlife Federation, we try to get people to plant native plants and stuff. So the birds, you know, do have what they're to eat, what they're looking for. Do you all get involved with that too, with your programs to promote that as well? If I knew about it, I would. I'm an avid birder and an avid gardener. So, and I only plant native wild, you know, species of, of bird, of bird friendly and bee friendly, insect friendly plants. Um, so if there is that, you please let me know. I, I would like to get involved. <laughs> the, uh, the raptors that you deal with, do you ever, do you like keep a record or do you follow up uh, in terms of, you know, once they've been, you know, turned over to a rehabilitation facility, mm -hmm. uh, do you kind of keep a record of, and, you know, what percentage of these birds do you think eventually get returned to the wild? Um, about 56% last year. So it's pretty good odds. And ones that aren't returned to the wild are typically, um, they're, they're placed in, in like an educational program if they can be, if, if they can't be released. Have you ever had occasion to uh, submit something to the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Forensics Lab, Wildlife Forensics Lab? I don't know that I have. No? Okay. Oh, um, are you talking about like uh, for investigations? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's oh, out yes. in, I think it's in Oregon or Washington, um, Oregon. I, I have had... I have had submitted some cases where actually federal agents have had to come out and collect evidence that I have gotten for them uh, in order to um, take care of yeah. things that were not supposed to happen. <laughs> yeah. You were saying earlier that like if you were to get an invasive species, you'd have to put it down. But as far as I'm aware with like the uh, European starling, you can keep them legally as pets. If you were to brought, if someone was to bring one in for veterinary care, would you have to euthanize it, turn them away, or would you be able to treat them? So um, I'm not the, the animal police. Um, if someone brings me an animal that, hmm, if someone brings me an animal that has been um, stolen from the wild, can't be released, maybe it's a European starling and they just want it to be healthy. No, I'm not gonna take it from them and euthanize it. I'm not gonna do that because it can't be released and it's ill. And my job as a veterinarian is to end suffering and, and to, to treat illness. Um, so in that situation, no. I would not, I'm not going to confiscate an animal um, if it's something that can't be released. Okay. I do take some online questions now. People leaving the animals where they belong. <laughs> so I have a couple online questions here. This one's from Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie is wondering what would be the role of a veterinary technician in your hospital, in your practice? Well, I mean, the, our veterinary te technicians are the backbone of our practice. Um, they, I mean, gosh, they do everything. Um, they, they're the equivalent of a human nurse. And uh, Marilyn was wondering, and uh, I believe someone touched on this earlier with a question, uh, how do you find solutions for the odd creature is how they put it. Is it, and I was kind of wondering the same thing. I mean, with so many different species that are coming to your, to your door, is there, you know, you know, one size fits all with these practices or is it just a combination of your minds coming together and coming up with treatments? That's a really good question. Um, so I get bored easily and I really love to come up with uh, creative ideas and creative ways to, to fix things. And um, that is really important in the job that I have. Um, it's not unusual for me to have to invent a piece of equipment so that I can intubate this certain species because it has, um, it has a divider in its trachea. So you can't put a normal intubation, you know, tube in it, or, you know, we have to 
come up with creative ways to make pressure relieving bandages and little shoes. Um, so we have to invent and create and engineer uh, specific ways of treating our species. Uh, I believe you already answered this, but just to reiterate, so the main facilities that people should contact if they find wildlife in need of help? Uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. We direct people there all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I have one more question online here. Um, how has your experience as a veterinarian changed the way you see wildlife? Change the way you see animals in the wild? I mean, wow. Like I, I, I have always been just curious and, and, and wondering, you know, what are they thinking? Why do they do that? Um, and I think about it even more, uh, when I get to work with these animals intimately, the the complex interactions of different species. So going back to that, I've helped out previously as a volunteer for birds of prey, um, because of the Migratory Bird Act, um, transporting, um, is, is there, do you typically ever see an issue? Like if somebody finds like a down hawk or something like that, do we just automatically, I, I don't know about here cause I'm new to North Carolina. I just moved here a few months back. So I'm trying to make sure I understand how processes work for here. So if we do find, you know, like a hawk or something, or, you know, red shoulder, red top hawk or something that's needing some help. Mm -hmm. um, when I did transporting there, I had to have a specific certificate in order to transport that bird um, to the facility so that if I got stopped or anything that I wouldn't have an issue with mm -hmm. law enforcement for yeah. having a bird that's, you know, protected of, of some sort. So I'm just trying to make sure if there's anything in that nature. Um, I think in, a, in an emergency situation, you can take an animal to any veterinary practice that will see it for, you know, for care uh, and relief of pain. Um, as far as uh, going across state lines, I can't speak for that. I would imagine that you can't. I don't think that I, I can't think of a case where I've had someone bring something from across the state line. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Always count on John for an extra question. <laughs> With all of the development that's going on in the triangle, have you started to see any patterns in terms of the type of cases you're getting, for example, deer getting hit by cars or habitat, you know, shrinking and that having an impact on wildlife that's, you know, presented to you? I would say that I definitely, um, I see in the fall, especially, I see more uh, owl car strikes uh, because the roads are through their forests um, and that but they don't, they're not looking both ways and they just swoop through. And, and we, I, I feel like that's, I've noticed that more um, and more hit by car, you know, turtles um, for sure. Yeah. going to keep coming after you with the questions. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all these questions, um, but I appreciate everyone's interest. This one's from Zachary. Zachary's wondering, uh, can you tell us about the process? What happens if we find an injured animal? You know, what are your open hours? Looks like they're just looking for the specifics. You know, when can we contact you? Do you go and pick up the animal? Um, have them delivered? Uh, is there any associated costs? So essentially just what's the process if someone finds an injured animal to contact yeah. you? Yeah. So um, definitely, you know, call before coming because we're, we uh, are fully, you know, running practice, seeing appointments every day. Um, and so that way we can kind of uh, plan a, a, a triage team uh, for when that animal arrives. To, we may not even be have a cage available, you know, to put it in because we have to take them to isolation. Um, I would recommend calling first. Um, our first assessment of the animal is, can we save it or not? Um, uh, and and uh, in that case, we're, we're going to make sure that that animal doesn't suffer. Um, 
and costs involved. Um, we we take we will take wildlife, um, and we do you know, a lot of this work pro bono. We can't do just wildlife, so we we do we do uh, like it when people will you know donate some to help. Um, yeah. Mary Beth, uh, sorry, one more question here. Mm -hmm. Mary Beth is wondering, I think she's concerned that wire cages are hard on bird feathers. There might've been a photo in there of a um, of a bird in a wire cage. Can you speak to that at all or? Um, well, if the bird is uh, conscious and birds aren't gonna just flap up against the the cages and, unless, unless there's a reason. And if they're stressed and we keep our stress pretty low in the hospital. So um, that's it, we haven't seen it being a problem. I get one more. Uh, as I understand, and maybe someone else here can correct me, uh, because of chronic wasting disease, the Wildlife Commission is no longer taking injured deer to rehabilitation facilities. Is that the same uh, with your facility? Yeah, I, we haven't. I haven't seen a well that de that last deer, the big one that we had to to euthanize. That that's the last one that I've seen, and that one was um, kind of the beginning of this year this year so, so then, then as i understand they simply euthanize them on the spot uh, if they have chronic wasting disease yeah. yes well they won't know that till they euthanize them well there's no live test so. if they're showing signs of wasting then i would recommend euthanizing them if they were uh, debilitated well but, but it's my understanding that they won't bring an injured deer to any kind of facility because it might because we've got chronic wasting disease all over the state now and mm -hmm. they don't want to spread it so oh yeah i wouldn't recommend moving that animal exactly I should any any in injured field. deer yeah 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 okay yeah um with regard to turtles mm -hmm. over the many years i've been here yeah you see them hit by cars or just find them and they've been injured so what do you, you know, especially if they look like they've really been hurt, what do you suggest doing with them? I mean, I wouldn't want to have brought every turtle up that I found or someone brings to me. What could we do to help them without bringing them to you if it's pretty obvious they're you know, um, pretty far I, gone? I can't uh, recommend an at-home like euthanasia mm -hmm. just method. Let them be. Um, but I would recommend just contact the North Carolina Wildlife Re Resource Commission mm -hmm. um, or the turtle out the turtle uh, rescue uh, right. team at, at NC State. Mm -hmm. um, turtles can are much tougher animals than than you would you would believe, um, and can can uh, recover from a lot of really serious yeah. looking injuries. I've I've told some people to do that. Yeah, but yeah. I thought, well, <laughs> yeah. Any other options? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, no. No. Okay, any, do you have any more online questions? You do. John, John's gonna sneak one more in. <laughs> this doesn't relate entirely to veterinary care, but uh, I've been told that if you see, for example, a box turtle or other turtles crossing the street and you wanna get out and help them, <clears throat> that the worst thing you can do is, you know, travel any kind of distance uh because then they're out of their natural habitat so is that correct correct yes and you could be spreading disease to another part of the state so yeah so basically just let them go across the road and do their thing put them on the opposite side of the street <laughs> yeah where they're facing and if it's difficult if it's one of those situations where trying to put them on the opposite side of the street is hard to get to Watch, just put him as close as you can to, you know, where he was crossing. Sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> I guess. I don't know if there, there was a right answer there. All right. All right. I'll leave you alone. Now. Yeah, no, it's okay. I don't know all the answers. I don't have all the answers, everybody. <laughs> no, we're good. Yeah, okay. All right. Last call. Any last questions? Online or in the room? I have not. A lot of my staff has. Yeah. All right. So let's give it up for Dr. Locke. <laughs> Thank
thank you very much. I think everybody really enjoyed that. Uh, fascinated by some of those stories. Um, please join us for our next webinar, which will be on February 1st. We're going to have Chris Bass, who's the owner of Chris Bass Engineering. And he's a board member of Partners for Environmental Justice. And he'll talk about nature-based solutions and environmental justice. That's a webinar. It's not in person. As I say, we kind of alternate between just webinar and doing a hybrid. Uh, this is on uh, February 1st. So please join us for that. I want to thank uh, the webinar audience for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did here in Holly Springs. Uh, this is the end of the webinar.